I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today is part two of our accidental series. I was about to say unintentional series, yeah. (laughs) It just happens every so often. We start talking about something and go, you know what? This is actually really interesting. We should do more of this. So yeah, part two in our accidental song series. But like many children, accidental podcast series are actually oftentimes turn out to be quite good. Agreed. More spontaneous, <laughs> less planned. Week we did Wang Anshu, who's famous as the Song Dynasty reformer who comes up with what's called the Xinjiang, the the new policies, which are essentially a giant welfare the new reform. deal. It's the new deal. It's actually almost <laughs> almost matches up, doesn't not really new deal, but new policies, new deal. Yeah. Why not, right? Pretty much. Yeah. He is opposed by lots and lots and lots of conservatives in the Song Dynasty. Things don't really work out when the emperor who's got his back dies, then they kind of go back and forth. One of the main guys, the main conservatives who is resisting Wang Anshu is Sudong, who I will remind you in the last podcast, you compared to Ronald Reagan. If Wang Anshu was like compared their politics or like, yeah, I know I'm saying, but it's much funnier if we just compare him to Ronald Reagan. Let's just boil it down to that. I don't know if I could see Reagan doing Reagan versus LBJ, the poetry rap battle. Uh, yeah, I know. That was, that, actually, that would be really hilarious, but anyway. So, Su Dongpo, the conservative opponent, he's the one who doesn't want things to change, who thinks that the system is basically, fundamentally good, or at least it works well, it just needs to be tinkered with here and there, whereas Wang Anshu goes, no, 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 we need to overhaul this. Su Dongpo, I think, is... I mean, in my humble opinion, is the better poet. We'll get to that in a second. Do we need to give any kind of breakdown of the actual song first? Yes, really quickly. Um, (laughs) Wait, you're going to really quickly give us a breakdown of the Song Dynasty. I love it. Go for it. Let's hear it. Starting just 200 years before. No. Right, exactly. (laughs) On a December. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, So the Tang Dynasty collapses in 907, and things just kind of fall apart at that point. Mm -hmm. You have sort of the height of Chinese civilization by some measures, uh, and then it just kind of all disappears, and politically, China is really struggling. It's divided into multiple polities, and you don't really kind of know where things are going. There are a lot of non-Chinese rulers who are taking over, particularly in the north, which has been sort of a thing throughout Chinese history. You have all of these smaller dynasties. One of those smaller dynasties is the Song Dynasty. They established themselves in 960 in Kaifeng. It's just a general, Zhao Kuangyin, who establishes a new dynasty. And really, at the beginning of the dynasty, there's there's no telling that this is going to be different, that suddenly much of China is going to all of a sudden just kind of be united once again. But that's exactly what Zhao Kuangyin does. He unites much of the empire that China had previously had. And he starts thinking like, hey, you know, I as a general just overthrew the dynasty before me because I had this military power. So how am I going to make sure my sons don't get overthrown? And this is really the key component that that makes the Song dynasty stick. It's Zhao Guangyin's ability to kind of think through how to change things. Traditionally, in Chinese political thinking, there was a divide between Wen and Wu, Wu representing the sort of military establishment, Wen representing both literary establishment, but also kind of the civil function. Hard and soft power, basically. That's a that's a good way to, to think about it. Zhao Guanyin, he goes, for the song, we're going to emphasize Wen. We're going to play down... The, the military aspect and play up the literary aspect of the dynasty. Now, this had a couple of different things that came out of it. First off, though printing technology had been happening in the late Tang, it really kind of starts to hit in the Song. A lot of Song officials used print technology to make new text. During the Tang, you didn't actually have that much access to text. They were just a much rarer thing. And so the Song starts printing all this stuff. And because they're emphasizing the win, because they're emphasizing the literary aspect of government, anybody who's anybody is reading lots. And I should throw in here, and we'll we'll jump right back to the chronology, but in the podcast we did on Wang Anshu, I was mentioning how Strange it is to have statesmen who are also great poets, but in the song... That didn't really happen in the tongue. No, it didn't. But in the song, that makes total sense. It's almost like you couldn't be a statesman unless you were a figure of great cultural significance as well. And Sudong Po, who we're talking about today, and Ouyang Shou, who we're going to talk about 
both of them were some of the best poets of their era, but also some of the the top statesmen. Right, exactly. And, and the reason for that is because of this emphasis on when. There's a problem with that, right, Rob? Go for it. Tell me. So in the Tang, everybody agreed that all of the ancient texts were the source of all of this kind of wisdom. But everybody thought that the ancient text, the, the earliest Chinese text that still existed at that point, pretty much all said the same thing. Now, in the Tang, you didn't have that much access to these texts, so you couldn't go back and double check things. I mean, people did, but just because texts were so much rarer, it was much harder and there was much less discussion of this kind of stuff compared with the song. In the song, because you have printing and because the dynasty is emphasizing the win, it just makes much more sense that everybody and anybody who who wants to be somebody is going back and like making these arguments about these texts. And they go back and they see, actually, the ancients, they weren't all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. There are lots of different interpretations and different perspectives. This bitter feud between Su Dongpo and Wang Anshu, which we alluded to in the last episode, really comes out of these different interpretations. And the importance that you place on the classics, because neither person, neither Wang Anshu or, or Su Dongpo said would ever have dared say, for example, yeah, you know what? Who cares about Confucius? Just doesn't even matter. But Wang Anshu had a very different perspective on what you were supposed to do with Confucius. And his new policies come out of those interpretations. And if you've read much Confucius or the, you know, the Kong Mang, Kong Zi, Mang Zi, uh, Confucius Mencius canon, the poor are never far from their consideration. Economics and is a big Economics is a big thing. Yeah. And it's not really that dissimilar. We keep coming back to this, but this notion of the New Deal or state-funded work programs, it's a similar mindset where uh, does the government exist to make sure that everyone is taken care of? Like, is, do we start at the bottom, take care of the, the poor people, and, and eventually everything will filter up to the top? Or alternately, do we ensure that the top has the, the ability to move that they need and everything below it will be taken care of later. I want to go even more contemporary and suggest that in America, and I apologize for those of our listeners who are not U.S. based, that we sometimes think in terms of America, but I, I don't really know how else to, to kind of relate It's going to it. change soon because I'm moving to France. So That's true. Yeah. I'll be able to provide all kinds of wonderful on the ground observations about French society. But you can kind of think of the tension between Su Dongpo and Wang Anshu as similar to the way conservatives and liberals yes. debate the Constitution. Most people in the U.S. agree the founders were amazing, whatever, but they oftentimes disagree on how to interpret particular passages and what to place emphasis on. These can lead to really bad fights. Yeah, exactly. And what's what's really kind of interesting about it, they're drawing from a lot of the same literary wells as well. And that, to me, is one of the most interesting things about studying the Song versus this is where we really diverge from where things are today because maybe two or three hundred years ago, you would have had bitter statesmen who also both knew their Homer and had read Shakespeare and things like that. Definitely not the case today. Both Su Dongpo and Wang Anshu wrote incredibly interesting poetry from the same sort of roots, but they're doing very different things with it. So should we just dive into the, the Let's dive in. poems? Let's dive in. And I, but real quick, though, I should preface, we're, we're reading a, a, one or two poems of Su Dongpo, just like we read one or two from Wang Anshu. There's so many more than this. Uh, in some ways, it's not fair to just talk about, it's like talking about one Dufu poem. Today, we're looking at two of Stephen Owen's, his his translations uh, from the Anthology of Chinese Literature. One poem is called Getting Up at Night in a Boat, and the other poem is called Crossing the Sea on June 20th in the year 1100. Rob, what do you think of these poems? Well, I mean, they're they're incredible. I, I can't stress enough, if you enjoy poetry, how well worth your time it would be to read Su Dongpo, Wang Anshu. We'll, we'll start with getting up at night in a boat. Now, these both have a really interesting backstory. Do you want to relate a little bit of that? Yeah, so getting up at night in a boat is about the transcendental, ephemeral nature of existence. It's, it's, it's really the most quotidian of experiences. He just wakes up in a boat, gets at up night. at <laughs> night. That's, that's right. it. That's um, it. But, but it's very much a uh, it kind of emphasizes the the importance of of enjoying the moment. There's almost this Chan 
Buddhism. I think we've mentioned this on the podcast before, but Chan Buddhism is just Zen, Zen Buddhism, Buddhism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. but the Chinese version of that. There's, there's very much this emphasis on ephemerality and kind of embracing ephemerality. And today in the U.S., we talk about being present and the importance of living in the moment. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. That's the right word. And I'll throw this in too, and then I want to get to the poem. Su Long Po got moved around a lot. This is why a lot of his poems deal with with rivers and boats. So that he's waking up on a boat is both very quotidian, just an everyday thing, but it's also indicative of the fact that he was getting shuffled around a lot in the civil bureaucracy and never in a particularly nice way. We should mention, so poem is written in 1079. I'm not entirely sure if he has actually been made the emperor angry enough to be exiled at this point. I don't think so, but he will get, when you say he get got moved around and not in a nice way, what you're saying is <laughs> he, he got exiled. I he mean, he exiled. was lucky to, to survive with uh, all of his skin attached to yeah. them. I'm going to read two quick stanzas here because one line in particular I just find amazing. In night's depths, both creatures and men lie outside each other's concerns. And I was alone, a body and shadow for our mutual amusement. In the dark, river tides rose on the isles with the sad sounds of winter worms. The sinking moon hung in the willows which I saw as a spider's web. So this, Whoa, those are just incredible. It, it's fascinating because this poem is both uh, Sudong Po, the, the character in the poem, as a subject looking out and waking up and having this very quote, we keep using the word quotidian. I'm going to do it <laughs> again. Throw um, it in there. This, this very much a quotidian moment of just waking up and not knowing whether or not he's in a dream, which first off, Anybody who knows Hello, Chinese Zhuangzi. literature should know that, that that is an allusion to Zhuangzi, Absolutely. which we've done an episode on. Yeah. The butterfly dream where Zhuangzhou doesn't know whether or not he's a butterfly dreaming that he is a human or a human who was just dreaming that he was a butterfly. Second, I find this poem incredible because of the issues of subjectivity and objectivity. So you have Sudong Po who is writing here and he's talking about what he's seeing when he wakes up on the river. But... The poem seems to almost brood going from Sudong Po's eyes, Sudong Po's position, to the position of the river and the, the birds and, and the fish. The narrator goes from being Sudong Po, the character, to being these fish watching, watching Sudong Po. Yeah, that line especially, a body and shadow for our mutual amusement. First of all, mutual so they're they're looking at each other, or everyone's looking at Su Dongpo, the animals looking at him, and him looking at him for our mutual amusement. There's something comical or not serious about this great statesman. It's it's hard to imagine something quite that humble coming from politicians today. Like <laughs> probably a joke to the animals around me, right? And he also tends to emphasize the least possible creature. So if he was an object of amusement for a mighty eagle. Or a, a, a lynx prowling the banks, fine. But the second line of the, stand, the second stanza I read was with the sad sounds of winter worms. The poem ends, the final stanza is talking about the roosters crowing and kind of dawn coming. You're on a boat. Can you think of anything more every day than, than the worms roosters? roosters? Yeah, it's, it's just like typical kind of rural life in China. And it couldn't be less worthy of a poem. But Sudong Po turns it into this incredibly stunning poem. Yeah, and I can't emphasize enough how each line here, I think Steve Nolan really does a beautiful job with this translation in emphasizing what a great poet of this era can do with the constraints they have. Each individual line has something. The sinking moon hung in the willows, which I saw as a spider's web. That's a wonderful piece of imagery, but it also downgrades the moon. The moon has this long history in Chinese poetry. Did Li Bai ever write any poems about moons? No, I don't think he did. I think (laughs) you're thinking of somebody else, but did he write anything but moons? I saw as a spider's web. That's a neat comparison, but it also makes the moon seem almost, not almost, seem way less than it is. It just kind of hangs there. Like a spider web is what you would find in a barn or under a tree trunk. It's not this mighty thing that's hanging in the branches. So here's this, this great statesman poet. We don't know in what situation floating down the river on a boat, just that's what he's doing. And the sounds of the world waking up around him including worms, which there's no way you can hear worms. He has to be imagining something so basic 
that human beings can't even hear what's going on. But he's also imagining a kind of subjectivity for the worms, right? He is giving them a, the ability to act and be present. Sad sounds. The, the sounds of the worms moving are happy or sad. Maybe they're sad worms. I don't know what would make a worm sad, but you know, you never know, right? So he writes in a little later, this life goes by me in a flash with anxiety and troubles. Clear scenes like this pass my eyes and last but for a moment. Now keep in mind, this is a poem written in, this is when the new policies are being debated and enacted. Here we have him talking about the least important things, but clearly these everyday occurrences of worms and roosters and a winter storm coming and him hanging out on a boat, that's a metaphor for his his emotional state, which poetry in the Chinese tradition, it's, it's supposed to make verbal how you as a person feel. That's the, the objective of, of poetry. What I want to uh, start wrapping up with here is the, the poem also, though, ends with a great deal more noise. So what interrupts Su Dongpo's sort of reverie? After the rooster crows, it says the bell tolls. The birds all go scattering. So the moment is is broken by someone ringing a bell. They beat the drum at the front of the boat, again, shouting each to the other. Now, what I think is interesting about that close is if, if, if when you read up to that point, the assumption is Su Dongpo is all alone on some sort of skiff in the middle of the river, just sort of floating, tubing or something, you know, whatever the equivalent was <laughs> in the Song Dynasty. He's got his beer floating behind him in, in the cold water. But no, he's on a proper boat with oarsmen and the whole thing, right? And everyone is waking up. Can I ask, there's a there's a myth that Li Bai died drunk, falling off of a boat, trying to, to touch the moon or the moon's reflection, which he saw in the water. Do you see any of that kind of alluded to in this poem? Just- I, don't, I don't actually see that. I, I see that the... The notion of being on a boat and wishing you were somewhere else or yearning for other things and so that causes you to sort of move away from the boat. I can see that, yeah. I just, I, I think that the allusion to Zhuangzi, which Li Bai was associated with Taoism in the Tang Dynasty, and then this this reflection on the boat, it, it calls to mind that, that a Li little Bai bit. myth, but, but I, I mean, maybe I'm stretching well, it. What I think is really interesting, I said I was going to wrap up in a second. This happens frequently on the podcast. You keep talking. Right, we keep talk. I'm going to wrap talk. up now with the following 20 minutes of conversation. For as bitterly opposed politically as Wang Anshu and Su Dongpo were, they were not bitterly opposed poetically. When you look at the kinds of things they write about and the way they write about them, the human world is almost always a kind of intrusion. Wang Anshu in the, one of the poems we talked about last time basically says, look, human beings and their, their ways of writing and their, their stupid systems and stuff just don't get it. They don't understand the essence of it. If you really want to know what's going on, go back to the Cold Creek, right? And Su Dong Po here has a whole series of stanzas about how fleeting and how powerful these very simple moments in nature are. And what breaks them up is human beings with their drums and their bells and their oars and their boats. I disagree. I think Su Dongpo and Wang Anshu couldn't be more different. Interesting. I feel like Su Dongpo, his literary language is more dense. His, his writing is more elusive. And I just think he's a better poet than Wang Anshu. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could we can discuss, but in some ways, I almost prefer Wang Anshu for the simple reason that you have a lot of the same thoughts in a much more concise space, like a couple of lines. You're wrong. <laughs> I'm shocked. And and I'm not making any kind of nod, nod, wink, winks towards Reagan, um, but I think that Su Dong Po is just artistically... He's just so much better. I mean, this is like this is like comparing Zhang Ailing and Lu Xun. Like you mm, actually think Lu Xun is comparison. you you actually think Lu Xun is is probably the better writer, right? Depending on what we well, but and to be I, fair, I think on, Zhang Ailing ha, is better in terms of her her deployment of literary language. I think she's just her her writing is much much more beautiful than Lu Xun. Again, though, I think one of the problems with a podcast like this is we end up comparing. A poem or two. There are so many problems with the podcast. I know. Well, yeah, not just this, but I mean, the same kind of thing with Lu Xun and Zhang Ailing. Which is the better writer? It depends what you compare. You know, we should actually shouldn't go too far down that road because we'll end up having a ending this podcast in the song by, you know, whatever. But what I will say is, and we're, we are going to do, I think, another episode. So I think we have 
we did this accidental series in a very weird way in that we wanted to just do, it started out just as a podcast on why on should, right? Yeah. And we're realizing there's so much more we can right. kind of tackle. So we're going to save the other poem we were going to do for a later episode and just make this a longer series yeah. if that's okay. And let's maybe, let's see where we land for now. And then we'll see how it goes, because we are going to actually talk about one or two other Wang Anshir poems, as well as another poem or two by Suong Po, because we're realizing that they're both great poets in very different ways, and we'd kind of like to weigh in a little with a little more under our belts. This than is the this. thing I love about this podcast. It's not that we're any good. It's that we <laughs> realize how bad how bad we are and how much how much how, how completely unprepared we are for anything and how much we are learning just in the process of doing the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, so all I'll say, all I'll say for now is we can, we're going to disagree a little bit on Wang Anshir and Sudong Po right now. But Although gonna, having said that, I do love Sudong Po. This is not a, eh, I don't really like him. We're going to come back both to Wang Anshir and Sudong Po and we're going to hit Ouyang Shou and Li Qing Zhao for this entire, yes. to, to, to do an entire series on the song. Let's do it. Rob, before we go, yo, do, do you have any messages for the listener? Yes. Dear listeners, keep in touch with us. Email us, Twitter us, tweet us. <laughs> Know, you can right? you can tell Rob's like a we master don't. of the I'm social a master media. of the interwebs. <laughs> Chinese literature podcast at gmail.com and Chinese lit pod at Twitter. Also on Patreon. We love doing this. And, and we are moving out of grad school into the workforce. And, and we should thank everybody who who has given us any money yes, absolutely. from Patreon. We we love you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all for listening. I think about this. We just we just broke ten thousand podcasts what? a couple of days ago. Ten thousand downloads. Podcasts. Whew, it feels like 10,000 podcasts, 10,000 10, downloads per month. And a lot of those are people who started listening to us when we were still recording on a laptop mic in an echoey office room. Oh, and it man. sounded like doo-doo. Doo-doo. Yes, thank you. I wanted to also point out, please take a look at the Chinese Literature Podcast.com, which is our website where we put up a lot of these translations. I don't know if we're going to do translations on Sudong Po and Wang Anshur just Well, use. when you've already got Stephen Owen and some of the some it's of the kind of embarrassing there, yeah, to exactly. try and translate. Here's my version, you know. <laughs> but we, we do but sometimes we do our embarrassing translations anyways. Yeah. <laughs> and put them up there. Yeah. So if you know, take a look at some of our translations if you can. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.